Hello friends in ADHD, this is Russ Barkley back again with a short commentary on the topic of ADHD and in this commentary I want to briefly address the issue that there are no diagnostic tests out there for ADHD at this time. You know, a week doesn't go by, if not a day, that I don't receive emails from people asking me, is this test accurate? Should I use that test in my practice? Should I take this test that my clinician wants me to take? Uh, does this diagnose ADHD? And the answer, very short answer, there are no tests for the accurate diagnosis of ADHD in clinical practice. Let's quickly take a look at the tests that have been studied to date and that are not useful at this time for applying by a clinician to a patient in practice to make a diagnosis. Now, many of these tests I'm about to list were found to be useful in group studies, comparing groups of people with ADHD to people who don't have ADHD or people with other disorders. And in those group comparisons, these studies may have found that the means, the average scores for each group were different between the groups to a statistically significant degree. But notice what studies do. They're comparing group averages. That's not what a clinician does in practice. A clinician sees one person and has to make a decision at that time on the probability that the person has this disorder or not. That's known as individual classification, not group comparisons. And it's very possible to find a test that is useful in research that compares groups where we pick up these large or even moderate group differences in means that has no relevance whatsoever to clinical practice in diagnosing individuals accurately. Why is that? because the distribution of scores in the group study may show that the distribution for one group is separated by the distribution or from the distribution for another group, and it's comparing the means of those groups. But if those distributions of scores overlap to a considerable or even a modest degree, that test is not gonna be accurate enough to diagnose a person in clinical practice. And that's what we find in research on all of these tests, that while there are mean differences between the distributions of the scores of the groups, the distributions overlap too much. And that overlap is what creates the inaccuracy, the unreliability to use that test for diagnostic purposes. Many tests have been used, computerized tests of ADHD symptoms, of attention, of inhibition, even of activity level. Some of these are known as continuous performance tests, like the Gordon test, or the Connors test, or the TOVA, or the IVA, right? We've also looked at go-no-go no go tests. We've also measured activity level using wristwatches and videos that measure movement and all sorts of devices and none of them were sufficiently accurate to classify people in clinical practice, even though very useful in our group studies. The same applies to neuropsychological tests of ADHD symptoms, such as measures of executive functioning, working memory tests, tests of planning, tests of problem solving, the Wisconsin cart sort test, and looking at categorizing particular categories of stimuli for individuals, a very old test for executive functioning, tests of components of attention, tests of IQ and their subtests. None of these, despite their usefulness in group studies, can be used in clinical practice with an individual. There are studies of the EEG and also of a special kind of EEG that looks at the evoked electrical response to a stimulus in the brain. Not accurate enough for clinical practice, even though there may be group differences in certain EEG bandwidths between ADHD and typical people. We've looked at neuroimaging devices from spec scans like the kind Dan Amen recommends in his clinic to PET scans to MRI, CAT scan, functional MRI, and other even more accurate tests of brain networks in the brain. And despite the fact that in group studies,
differences on these measures may have been found between ADHD and typical people. The differences are subtle, mild, small, sufficient that you can't use these for diagnosing individuals accurately. The same applies to blood tests as well as to genetic tests. We know that ADHD is inherited. We know that there are genes that contribute to it, but we don't know all those genes. We don't even know most of those genes, and therefore we can't design a genetic test that can accurately tell us if someone has ADHD or not. And it may turn out that it's the combination of genes. So let's say just for the sake of argument that there are a hundred genes for ADHD, right? and that you need 10 or 15 of them to get ADHD, but the 10 or 15 one person has may be different from the other. So the genetic test simply can't be used to make that determination. I wish we had a test for ADHD that, could use, that we could use in clinical practice. We simply don't. So what we are left with is what we're left with in all of psychiatry and psychology. There are no tests no objective measures for any mental disorder at this time. So consequently, we have to fall back on our tried and true approach to diagnosis, which is an open-ended interview. What brings you here? What are you concerned about? And so on. Following that up with a structured interview, going through the DSM criteria for the relevant disorders we think might exist given what you've told us including those for ADHD. If it's ADHD, we're going to review them a second time for whether or not those symptoms and criteria existed in your childhood. We're also likely to give you broadband rating scales of different kinds of psychopathology, depression, anxiety, attention, and so on. We'll follow that up with rating scales that are specific to ADHD or other disorders like adult ADHD or child ADHD rating scales. These rating scales have norms for the population so we can determine how deviant a person is that is how abnormal their score is on the scales. We need to find measures of impairment through interviews, through records, and some rating scales of impairment in major life activity. If we think they're relevant, we'll do a quick screen for intelligence or academic achievement tests because learning disabilities can be very common in people with ADHD. We'll follow that up by interviewing someone who knows you well. And if we can't find such a person, person then we're going to fall back on your school records or other archival records to indicate presence of likely symptoms and impairment that have persisted over at least six months or more. So that's what we're going to be looking for. That's it. No objective measures of ADHD exist right now that are accurate enough to be recommended for clinical practice for diagnosing ADHD in either children or adults. I hope you found this commentary useful to you. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you like this content, recommend us to others. And as always, I will sign off by saying, live well, be well, and see you next time. Thank you so much.